Thank you. So, one note before I get started. Um, at SAS, we have been working on our data science education capabilities. And, um, oh, can nobody hear me? Can nobody hear me? Okay. Should I stand here and talk? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I am a data scientist, and, and at SAS, we've been, we've been working with our partners at Cloudera and our education practice to create a, some data science education courses, and we're right now we're calling it the Data Science Academy. Um, if you are interested in this educational opportunity, uh, please talk to Sarah at the back before you leave. It's, it's a really cool new thing. We've been collaborating with Cloudera. Um, it should be very useful. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about the contemporary analytical ecosystem. So basically, this is just my spiel on, on what's going on out there. And please feel free to ask questions. Please feel free to tell me I'm a moron. Um, so I, we're going to start off with some jokes. They're, they're pretty bad. But people in Australia did laugh at them. A few people did. So we'll, we'll, maybe you guys will think they're funny. OK. so. Here's our statistician. It's all based on the conversation between the statistician and the data scientist. Okay, yes. Yeah, see, I told you it's, it's, bad. it's bad. All right, one more, one more. And then the data scientist says. Okay, so this is kind of getting at there is this cultural divide between um, data scientists and statisticians, or, or just basically. Um, perhaps people that were trained in more traditional approaches and people who have kind of gone out there and learned on their own. Maybe, maybe that gets more to it. And we, can, we can talk about that during the, the networking launch. Okay, so um, we're going to do a quick history lesson and then we're going to talk about some buzzwords. And then uh, the main part of the presentation is called Machine Learning for X. So this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently, people really are wanting to try these new quote unquote machine learning techniques in, in, um, in many industry verticals. And I'm going to talk about some use cases that we have been approached with or that we have put into practice. And uh, we'll just follow up with a couple other ideas that I think are important these days. Okay, so we've all seen a graph like this. Yeah, there's lots of data. Um, usually these graphs are made by somebody like Oracle or SAS. So maybe you should take them with a grain of salt. You know, we're trying to sell you stuff so that you'll do do more with data. Um, I do think there. I do think the amount of data is growing. Who? Will anyone make a guess at what percentage of this data is actually valuable? Does anybody want to make a guess at that? That sounds good. That sounds good to me. I did you say one or five? Yeah, but that. I don't know. I don't know. But I certainly don't think it's all of it, OK? All right, and just in case you weren't aware, it's a lot of data. And our ability to move it around on hard disk has actually been slowing down relatively. RAM is getting cheaper and cheaper. CPU speed has actually been slowing down. It's become more and more cost effective for the chip manufacturers to put more cores on a single chip than it is to make a single core faster, okay? So what, what does all this, what does this history mean? You know, where, where is this getting us to? SAS, Spark, uh, H2O, probably others, we're all pushing really hard to get to this distributed in-memory uh, processing of data, okay? This is probably how most of us work today, right? We have our laptop, or we have our server, or we have our workstation. This is certainly how I do a lot of work. Um, but I am moving into this more and more. So I think we will move, you know, if, if, if big data is truly valuable, which I think it is, for certain reasons, in certain in certain industry verticals, I think we're going to move into this paradigm more and more where um, we wear T-shirts. See, we used to wear suits and ties, but now we wear T-shirts. 
So that's really important because if you wear a suit and tie around a Hadoop cluster, it will actually burst into flames. <laughs> it's, not, it's not true at all. So um, yeah, I think, I think we're going to move towards this paradigm, especially in large industries. You may find it unnecessary in your industry, and that's totally fine. OK, so some buzzwords, right? Lots of buzzwords. And that's good, because people are actually interested in what we're doing. Um, probably for people who have been in this field a long time, maybe, maybe this is the first time that you actually hear in the news people are talking about cognitive computing, Internet of Things, cloud. So um, I am not saying that these technologies aren't useful. I think they're going to be very useful and important. I'm just saying we're going to have to live through a terrible amount of hype first before they actually become useful. Have you guys ever seen this, the um, uh, Gartner's hype cycle diagram? So um, typically, you know, somebody invents a technology and, you know, people go crazy about it. They're tweeting about how it's going to be a $20 trillion industry and it's going to cure cancer and we'll all be unemployed. And, um, so I think we're going to have to live through that just like we did with big data. And, but, but eventually we'll get to the place where these things are very useful and important. All right. So the first one is cognitive computing. Really, really cool, right? But it hasn't affected your economy unless you're a professional Jeopardy player. <laughs> is anyone using cognitive computing in their business? When I asked this question in Melbourne, one person said yes. OK. So um, it's coming. It's certainly coming. It's going to be really important. It, I, we just have yet to see widespread profitable use cases, OK? Internet of Things. This is not my cartoon. This is something I got off Twitter. Um, but I do think it's a, pretty, it's a pretty good synopsis of the Internet of Things. You know, one day, and if you, know, if you read Twitter or the Internet or blogs, that day is yesterday, um, you know, your refrigerator is going to be talking to satellites and Amazon, and, and your groceries are going to show right up, to your, um, right up to your refrigerator. But in reality, we are still struggling with things like sensor data. And what we found from our clients is, you know, sensors aren't necessarily 100% dependable. And do you really want to make a business decision based on a sensor that's just malfunctioning? Okay, so what if your refrigerator sensor breaks and tells Amazon that you're out of food and you get a whole shipment of food that you didn't need, you know? Or what if you're trying to drive an oil tanker and you have a sensor out in the Atlantic Ocean telling you there's some problem, you know, do you really want to make this giant business decision about diverting an oil um, an oil tanker based on a sensor. I mean, this is a really hard thing for people to, to feel comfortable with. And um, so, so just, some, just injecting some reality into this discussion. Um, streaming analytics are really hard, and they're actually really restrictive right now. And there's a really easy reason for this. The data is there, and then it's gone. So when your neural network goes to iterate over it again, it's already gone. Okay. So we're limited in, in the complexity of analytics we can do on streaming data. It has to basically be simple business rules or updating regression parameters, something easy. That's usually fine, though. And then there's the whole privacy concern. And um, this, this is huge, right? Do you really want Amazon to know what you're eating and when you're eating it and, and your caloric intake? And then they're going to be advertising you about diets and exercise or eat more kale, you know, do you really want this? Do people really want this? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, another thing, these cloud machine learning platforms where, um, you know, I, I upload my data and I, and, I, and I get insights out. So I think everybody loves this because it's, it's easy, there's no on-premise install, but, but I've yet to meet a very serious bank or healthcare organization that is actually considering giving anybody their data. So I think we'll, we'll see a lot of private clouds. And I, and I think for smaller, meteor, uh, medium-sized organizations whose data operations aren't mission critical, this is fine. Uh, I think it's going to be a long time until this security issue gets worked out and large you know, um, industry-leading organizations feel comfortable giving private data, shooting it up into the cloud. Okay. Big data. So I think we finally lived through the hype cycle of big data. Maybe. Maybe. So I don't know if you saw this article, but um, Gartner published an article and the Wall Street Journal picked it up about Hadoop adoption. And it was something like 284 you know, major businesses 
54% said they had no plans to adopt to do it. Um, and only 18% said they had plans to invest within the next two years, okay? Um, I was just speaking to a bank on this kind of world tour. Um, they had no interest in Hadoop whatsoever. They were doubling down on their Teradata, RDBMS infrastructure. The, the whole big data adoption thing, I think people are realizing it's gonna take time. And then I think for statisticians, this is really funny. The whole big data thing was really funny because um, you know, statistics is a science about inferring information about a population based on a sample. So um, I think, I think that, that the whole sampling issue was always there with big data and, and uh, there's reasons not to sample. There's, can anybody name a reason? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't sampling be appropriate for a certain application? Can anybody think of an application where sampling isn't appropriate? When there are there. Are, when you're working with population data. Okay, when you're working with population data, and I would say things like um, like anomaly detection. You have to be very careful when you're sampling if you're doing anomaly detection because you might take a sample and there might not be any anomalies in it. Um, recommendation actually tends to be a real big data problem. Um, so so I think we're finally we live we've lived through the hype cycle and we're getting to the point where people are okay with using small data for some things and they're figuring out where they really need to use big data. Okay, so machine learning for X. Alright, so what is machine learning? Um, it is if you're feeling like there's a lot of overlap between statistics and machine learning and data mining and databases and data science, I would agree with you, okay? I think the boundaries between all these fields are very, very gray, um, very tenuous, but for the sake of this discussion, okay, I tried to make this as visual as possible. We're gonna zoom in on this area, um, the intersection between data mining and machine learning, okay? Here we go. So what I'm saying is in this intersection between machine learning and data mining, um, there's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and semi-supervised learning. Um, and there are also plenty of things in machine learning that aren't a part of data mining, and we're not going to talk about those. So, or in my opinion, aren't part of data mining. In, in supervised learning, the, I'm just gonna try to explain this as simply as possible. Um, here's your crash course, okay? So in supervised learning, we, we have a Y variable or a target variable or a label or a dependent variable. We know the answer, okay? We're able to train a model while we know the answer. And, you know, just very, you know, the, the, the classic supervised learning questions are the classic regression questions. How much is someone going to spend and are they going to spend yes or no? Um, and the difference is with machine learning, we, we tend not to use traditional generalized linear models and really that's the only difference. We tend to sacrifice, um, we tend to sacrifice interpretability that the generalized linear models give you um, for hopefully better predictions using things like neural networks and gradient boosting, random forest and support vector machines. We're trying to pick up on really um, nonlinear or faint things in our training data and we're willing to sacrifice interpretability to do so. So unsupervised learning, the, um, the classic ones are clustering. Who's done clustering? K who's done k-means clustering? Okay. Um, clustering is when we group a row of observations, or when, I'm sorry, sorry. Clustering is when we group rows of observations together, rows that are more similar to one another than they are to other rows in the data set. And typically, um, for SAS customers, these rows are customers. So we're, we're usually grouping customers together, but sometimes items, sometimes other things. Um, Another really common example of unsupervised learning is frequent item set mining or market basket analysis. Who's done market basket analysis? Okay. Um, and then what about principal, who's done principal component analysis? Okay. So, so I would call, in, 
in machine learning, we have fancy names for everything. And we would call um, principal component analysis a feature extraction technique. And that means, that means we are somehow taking our original variables and recombining them into some kind of smaller, more representative set of variables. So most common things in unsupervised learning are clustering, grouping the rows of the data set together, and feature extraction, grouping the columns of the, of the data set together. Now, semi-supervised learning is something we're going to talk about a little bit today. It, it kind of works on the idea of combining information that I can learn from the data without a label and information the data I can learn with a label. Um, and I, I think I'm going to leave it at that for now. It, it's, it's becoming more and more common. I think, I think you'll see more and more of it. Okay, and again, here's the crash course. So, people really want to try this stuff, okay? People in, you know, many, many different industry sectors are, are getting to the point where they are willing to sacrifice some level of understanding of their model to make better predictions. And that's, that's the goal here. Or some, sometimes there's different goals. Here's an example from healthcare. This is a paper, um, and we have actually been we have been approached by epidemiologists about similar similar types of, of um, problems. So in this paper, they are trying to predict uh, West Nile outbreaks in in Egypt, and this was one of the first times that a quote unquote machine learning model. In, in this in case in this case they used a, a random forest, an ensemble of decision tree classifiers or regression. To, to predict these outbreaks of West Nile. And you can see this is not an easy series to forecast. It's very spiky and intermittent. And um, the random forest actually beat the ARIMA models pretty handily. Um, and there are, there are all kinds of advantages to using the ensemble models. It's very easy, it's very easy to get your exogenous uh, covariates into the model. So basically they trained on covariates and lags of the time series. It's a very simple data setup and we're able to beat the ARIMA model. Um, in the US, predicting hospital readmission is big these days because of all the healthcare reforms that we've gone through. And um, it's getting to the point where apparently the hospitals or healthcare providers will be compensated less by the government if patients are readmitted for the same problem. And when you start saying, you know, telling people they're going to get paid less, then they start to care. And so um, there's a huge, huge rush to predict hospital readmissions. And then looking forward, there's going to be all kinds of unstructured data in electri electronic medical records. The data is a mess right now. Um, people are really struggling with it. Practitioners are struggling with it to the point where I'm not sure there's there's very few actual production analysis, production and you know analyses of, of electronic medical records that I'm aware of. But I think in the future it's going to be a big deal. Okay, so um, asset protection. This is a big deal too. Companies buy these expensive products like MRI machines. <laughs> airplanes, wind turbines, and this is, this is one project we were aware of where um, uh, a company was trying to predict when they needed to do maintenance on a wind turbine because it's much cheaper to do maintenance than it is to replace a wind turbine. And it, you may call this machine learning or you may call it statistics, that's fine, but, but um, it, it turned out to be a really easy little little analysis. So, so if we look at wind speeds and something, if we look at moving averages over five or ten minutes, um, we see that most of the windmills are correlated. I mean, if you looked every second, they wouldn't be correlated because windmills in one part of the wind farm are spinning and the ones in the back aren't spinning. But if we take a moving average over five or ten minutes, these, these things are pretty correlated. And so if we have a correlation matrix and all the values are correlated, we really only need one um, variable to describe that correlation matrix. And if you do principal component analysis, that one variable is called, um, it would be the first eigenvector or the first principal component. Um, but if they become, if one windmill becomes decorrelated in this, you know, in this moving window, 
then all of a sudden I need two variables, so I need the first eigenvector and the second eigenvector and the first eigenvalue and the second eigenvalue to describe this system. And if that second variable that we need to describe the system because the correlation matrix isn't all the same all of a sudden, um, if that gets big enough, then that means one of the windmills probably needs to be looked at and it's, um, you know, have some maintenance done. So, in terms of all the complicated things you can do, it's a pretty, pretty easy little trick that can save a lot of money. Okay, and this kind of gets back to the thing, this isn't particularly real time, you know, this, this is averaging over five or ten minutes, and this, this is what we find people doing, you know, in more realistic scenarios, because if you do have a sensor that's going haywire, it's not as important if you're averaging, if you're, if you're looking over five or ten minute windows, okay? So, so we, don't, we don't see many people going completely real time yet, but we see more and more people who are interested in acting quicker than they used to. That's for sure. Okay. Um, so manufacturing. If you are still in the manufacturing business, then you probably have whatever you're <coughs> manufacturing down to a science. But they still want to do better, okay? They still want to um, get to subhuman levels of, of being able to detect defects in their products. And one way that companies are interested in doing this is with a, a technique called deep learning, which we're going to talk about very quickly. Um, and what this picture is meant to represent is some kind of high resolution <coughs> scan of some kind of product. So one, one of the manufacturers that we work with has over a million sensors on their, on their production line. So they really have big data. That's real big data. Okay. So what is this deep learning thing? Who's heard of deep learning? All right. So deep learning is this deep learning is this new hot thing in machine learning. And it and I didn't put it in the buzzwords because I do because I don't think it's overhyped. I think it's it's very very important. Um, it's it's led to many many breakthroughs in the field of pattern recognition over the last couple of years and. Um, as you'll see, it's too complicated for people to really jump on the hype bandwagon because, you know, it's it it's so complicated that it's hard to get it into 140 characters or whatever. Okay, so um, deep learning is really the rebirth of neural networks, and it's neural networks with many hidden layers. And if you're not familiar with the neural network, you can just think of it as a fancy kind of regression where we're kind of feeding the results of one regression into another regression into another regression, and we're trying to catch these nonlinear, very faint signals in the data. Okay, so what we've learned with deep learning, and um, this is a slide from Stanford, that used to be on the slide. Don't, I don't want to, I don't want to ask taking credit for this. So this is a very, um, this is a very um, popular paper that was put out by a researcher at Stanford. Um, it's able to learn about data at different scales, and that's really cool. So what this picture is meant to, to uh, show is, you know, here's all these multicolored pixels, and then in these in these deep networks, you know, moving up these layers, one, two, three, we're able to learn about the data at different scales. So if you have little pictures of people's faces, and your each network kind of learns something interesting, and, and the representation gets, you know, is more. It's a hierarchical representation. So here's the very smallest representation. Here's the, the pieces that make up parts of the face. Here's the parts of the face. Here's the whole face. OK. So it is kind of a semi-supervised technique. Um, typically in statistic, in, in regression modeling or in supervised learning, we have some target value or dependent variable y that we're trying to predict using x variables or understand using an input vector of x variables. Um, this is, this setup is really just it. the way that people draw neural networks. I mean, this is really just a logistic regression. If you're sitting there and you're like, great, what is this guy talking about? So this really is just a log logistic regression with like um, six, six parameters, okay? Um, we we put in the we put in the x values. Um, we put we give a parameter for every x in each one of these hidden units. We run it through a logistic function and we find the, the parameters that fit the model the best. So this really is logistic regression. This is a trick, okay? And this is where the unsupervised learning comes in. We always do this first in deep learning. So this is um, you can think of this as kind of like a multivariate 
logistic regression where I was trying to predict the vector of x from x itself. I'm just trying to regenerate x. Why would you do that? What, what does this little trick do for us? Well, it turns out this is a great way to learn a lot about x without knowing anything about y. Okay? So, so this is the unsupervised piece, and we, we, can, we kind of combine what we can learn in an unsupervised way, and then we fine tune that with what we can learn in a supervised way. And that's why it's semi-supervised learning, or some people would say it's semi-supervised learning. So the way this usually works is um, we have some big data set of x's, and we, we train these networks layer by layer. This is the big trick in deep learning. So we train these networks layer by layer, and we retain information that we learn each time, which is represented by the weights of the network, but at the parameter estimates. And we keep, we keep retaining them. Okay? And now, at the top, it's just, it's just learn from practice that, that you kind of initialize the top by just doing logistic progression. Um, but now, we have, this, we have this giant system that we've set up that we have initialized somehow by unsupervised learning, and then we refine it with a little bit of supervised learning, and we're able to make really, uh, it turns out this makes really state-of-the-art breakthroughs in pattern recognition. I've only ever seen this used once um, for, for an actual kind of customer task, but I, I think we'll see that more. But, but really, the focus of this is pictures, images, videos, sound. This is how um, uh, voice recognition in Android phones works. Okay, so here's some use cases. You're like, oh, you know, what? Why should I do it? All right, there's a government agency, and they're they're in charge of either it's like they're in charge of regulating um, childcare, and childcare facilities are supposed to have fences around pools or, or fences around them of a certain height. But this government agency has something like one tenth of the people that it needs to actually go out and measure all the fences. So they have this pretty brilliant idea. Um, um, using satellite photos to measure the height of fences using this very, very accurate pattern recognition technique. Okay, and they weren't joking. I'm not saying I don't know if they pulled it off or not. They approached us with this idea, and um, I think it's possible actually because they know they know where the satellite is, they know where the, the picture was taken, they know the time of day, they know the position of the sun. I I think it's possible. All right. Another big one is security, so facial recognition. For, for a long time, um, when people said facial recognition, they just meant um, saying that something was a face, not saying who the face was. I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys know that or not, but when people were like, excellent facial recognition results, what they meant was being able to pick faces out of a picture, not saying who the face was. So this is about saying who the face actually is. Um, this was a pretty sensitive um, government security application. And you know we can't show you the real data, but this is everyone in SAS Netherlands, or most of the people in SAS Netherlands. SAS Netherlands, okay. And the way this works is we train one of these you know deep neural networks, but we, we do it in an unsupervised way. And and basically what we're doing is we're able to project from the the high dimensional space of these images, where each pixel in the image is an input variable, and we're able to project that down onto two dimensions, okay. So we're starting with, with these images where, um, where, every, where every pixel in the image is a variable, and so that's a very high dimensional space, and we're going to project it down onto a low dimensional space using one of these unsupervised neural networks. For those of you who are familiar with principal component analysis, this is just going nonlinear principal component analysis. All right, so we're able to project everyone down into this two-dimensional map. Right? And I, I, I know this guy. I don't, I don't know these other people, but you know, apparently in the office this was really funny seeing who the outliers were. And, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're, once you get it down to two dimensions, you can do very sophisticated analytics like hierarchical clustering. And you know, I'll leave it up to you to decide if you think that these people look the same. Again, there are lots of jokes in the office about you know, younger people looking like certain older people, you know, and that, no comment, right? And so, um, but this is the idea. 
And then this this was also fun. <laughs> so 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 this is great. This is how you would really do this, right? Once you have this model that 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 projects images down onto two dimensions, I mean you just run Brad Pitt through it, you see where he lands on this map, and then you see who the closest people are to him. Alright? And um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't think this is how Facebook is doing this, but um, this is how someone approached us about doing it, and it, it seemed reasonable to me. All right, another application of, of this image recognition stuff. So um, we would call this dictionary learning, and this is this is in um, the energy energy vertical. So energy companies have all of these pipelines. You know, whether it's pipes in a power plant, pipes that natural gas go through, pipes that oil go through, and it's really bad if the pipes have a crack in them or burst. And, and one way that, that we've heard of people checking this is they run robots through them and they videotape, and, and then they want to see, well then somebody has to sit there and see if there's a, uh, a crack in the pipe. And I don't know about your job, but I like my job a lot better than um, <laughs> watching a robot go through a dark pipe for eight hours. Because there's never a burst, right? I mean, that's the hardest. That, that's the thing that's basically impossible for a human. You know, there's there's never um, there's never a burst. The burst is so so rare. So so I mean, it's it's just impossible for a person to sit there and then actually see um, then actually see the burst. You know, when because it's because it's so rare, you know, you just you can't pay attention at that level. All right, so the idea here, a very efficient way to do this kind of thing is you make these little dictionaries of representative images, and then you have a human expert say, well, this one really looks like a burst in a pipe, okay? So we're going to take this one, and we're going to match it to every frame in the video, and when there's a strong match, we're going to take a second look at that. Well, it turns out that um, these... Deep learning, these neural networks are able to um, to make these dictionaries in a really easy and efficient way. So typically, typically you you would maybe have a human expert or use other computer vision techniques to generate this dictionary of representative images. But it turns out when you use this neural network structure, um, you get this dictionary of images as a byproduct of the training. Okay. And so what I'm showing here is that. <coughs> Hidden, certain hidden units have, will, will, um, will have the same number of weights as there are um, input and output variables, and so we can graph them in the same way that we would graph the input and output variables. And so if I look at you know, what this hidden unit has learned, to me it looks like it's learning how to filter out eights. I don't know. I mean, there's no... There's no scientific way to prove that, but um, if you take a look at more, you know, this, they really are, they're, like to me, this one really looks like a six. Okay, and the, this, is, this is unsupervised learning. This is, this is the machine learning on its own. It's learning how to piece these little pictures together, and these were little pictures of hand-drawn images. You know, this one really looks like a five, this one really looks like six, maybe that one looks like a nine. So they're really able to, to learn their own representation of this data, and they're able to make these little dictionaries. And it's much easier for a human expert to look at this dictionary and pick out something important than it is for them to look at hours and hours and hours of video. OK, so um, we went through six or eight years of scientific literature in about six minutes. So hope you hope you understood. I'm just kidding. All right. Um, if you want to talk about it more later, please, let's, I'll be here. So another, another big idea I'm seeing these days is the, the idea of the citizen data scientists. So these are people who want to use data for the good of humanity. Um, I don't know, I, I live in Washington, D.C., and I see all these meetups for like Civic Hack Night. Um, we're really going to, you know, we're going to get together, we're going to do pro bono data science, data science for the good of humanity. I think another really common phenomenon is, um, we couldn't find a data scientist, so you're the data scientist, okay? We didn't, we didn't want to pay a data scientist, so you're now the data person, okay? <laughs> um, and this, this is leading to a lot of new products in the market. Uh, DataKind is actually a company in the US that kind of matches data scientists with pro bono work. Um, 
And then the, these two here are, um, they're like those cloud analytical services where you give them your data set and they give you insights. And I think for the trained analyst, that's a terrifying, um, a terrifying proposition. But for someone whose boss said, you know, you find insights about this data or you're in big trouble, I'm sure they're like, oh, thank God, you know. Um, and again, I'm seeing more and more graphs and graphs and charts like this in newspapers and on social media. I think the average person is getting more and more attuned to data analysis and using data in their life and expecting data analysis. So I think this is a trend that, that we'll see at least for a little while, maybe increasing. All right, another thing that's happening that's very real is um, these high quality distributed open source analytics platforms. And they're really good. They, I mean, they're, they're not perfect, but they're really good. So, um, Spark is an in-memory platform that sits on top of Hadoop. It has excellent extract, transform, and load capabilities um, in a distributed platform. It, we have been involved, it, its current machine learning library, NLlib, is a little immature. I don't know if anybody's used it, but you'll find if you do use it, it's fast, but you know, if you if you give it a thousand variables, you're gonna get back a thousand regression parameters and a um, Scala object or, or something, you're, you're going to have to deal with that, okay? It's your problem. Um, H2O, it's not the opposite. Very, very light on the, very, very light on the data preparation side, but very good for actually doing machine learning. So, this is a trend that it's asked, of course, we have to be you know, very aware of because the, these are true, these could be true competitors, and maybe they even are true competitors today. So, we, we have to keep our eye on this. And um, it's, it's certainly something we're aware of, and it's something real in the market, and these are quality tools that people can use for free. Okay. So, the machines are not, um, the machines are not taking over yet. Not yet. Because this is how, this is reality, okay? Um, in, in, um, in large organizations especially, and I think it's, one, all right, so another thing I'm seeing is that, you know, smaller organizations, especially where, you know, whatever they're doing with data isn't mission critical, um, they do not have the same concerns as large organizations. But for large organizations, um, this is very typical. You know, they have the data scientists or the analysts, whatever you want to call it, their bosses are telling them to do one thing, you know, get insights, build models. Um, for, for the company to actually use the models, it has to be put in their production systems. The IT people, their bosses are telling them something completely different. You know, they have completely different objectives, completely different goals, and um, oftentimes, I mean, it's not uncommon at large companies to take years to implement a model, okay? To go from the analyst getting the model parameters having the, the IT or whoever it is put it into the production system where the organization can actually use it to make money, it's not uncommon for that to take years, okay? And and I don't see that changing anytime soon, okay? Like if we go back to Spark and um, H2O, yeah, those might help you train models faster, but they're not gonna help you solve this problem, okay? And and you know, of course, this is something that SAS works really hard on because this this is real life. This is where we are today. And um, any any of those projects that I showed you, you know, if, if they are pulled off or the ones that have been pulled off, um, if so, it was the blood, sweat, and tears of many human beings that made it happen. Okay, it wasn't just machine learning happened and the answers were there and everyone made a lot of money and went home. That that never happens. Okay, so. Um, Feel free to find me out, um, out on the internet and harass me or, or whatever. Um, these, these are blog posts that I've written that I actually really like. Um, keep the science and data science. This, this is how I always close. If, if you call yourself a data scientist, please use the scientific method. Okay? And I wrote I wrote a little article about it. It gives what I would call examples of using of using the scientific method and doing your data science work. And um, if if this was all really confusing to you, and you and I haven't completely turned you off machine learning, this is this is a much shorter introduction to machine learning that you might that you might be interested in that has um, no graphs of neural networks and no equations. 
And um, who's aware? Okay, you guys are aware of the SaaS communities, I guess, because you're mostly SaaS users. So I'm out, I'm out there sometimes, and um, I, I hope to hear from you. So thank you for your time. And I guess we have time for some questions. Or, okay. So questions? Okay, in the back. So the question is, the question is, is there is machine learning in a SaaS package? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So yes, um, machine. Most of the machine learning is in SaaS Enterprise Miner, but it's kind of all about what you call machine learning. So the neural network, support vector machine, random forest, gradient boosting. That's all in uh, the Enterprise Miner product. But SAS Stat has all kinds of different sophisticated regression, clustering, nonlinear models, um, K nearest neighbors. So that's, that stuff is in SAS Stat. And then, of course, the newer product, uh, Visual Statistics, has decision trees, um, proc imps. So it's, it, yes, machine learning is all over the place in SAS. You just kind of have to find it. And um, talk to your friendly SAS representative about how they can, <laughs> about how you can do more machine learning with SAS. But I will say, if um, I have some, if you if you find me on GitHub, I have some code out there that shows you how you would code it up. But a lot of our stuff is about making it easier for people, so it's graphical interfaces. But if you wanted to see an example of SAS code, or if you have Enterprise Miner, um, if you go here, you'll be able to see some examples. Other questions? No, I think we are done. Okay, I killed them with PowerPoint. You are awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. because uh, I somehow come out of them feeling really smart. Um, I don't quite know how, but uh, I do. And this is what we try and do for science. We try and, uh, and in the big, um, oh, thank you, yeah, MC school. Uh, this is what we try and do uh, at the big events, is do this on a larger scale. Um, I have a Twitter winner. Uh, it is at Carlo Road. We learned a lot. I'm hoping to hear a lot from you from the surveys. We'll be capturing them at lunch. Um, please uh, demand more from us because we are a committee that serves the community. If the community tells us what we want, what you want, we want to come and deliver it next year at Suns of Auckland 2016. So now uh, I'm going to close because we have Nicholas from Stella B. Live to wrap things up and then point us in the direction of the night. Have lunch. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Brilliant. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Rowan, thanks very much. Stella are uh, delighted to uh, be involved with this year's Sun's Conference, and to be honest, I still can't believe that it was 1980, I think you said, when you were last here. 35 years, that is uh, disgraceful, but great to see you back, and uh, great to hear that you'll be back in force again next year. Look, just very quickly, uh, Stella uh, Consulting, our New Zealand's largest independent BI consultancy. Uh, we have the pleasure of working with a number of great suppliers of product, including, of course, SAS, and we operate across a raft of industries, both public and uh, private sector. We've been going for over eight years now, and with a team of 40-odd uh, consultants, uh, we have a fairly unenviable uh, customer list from uh, utility organisations through financial companies, uh, the likes of uh, Global Dairy Trade, who you heard, you'd heard uh, Kevin refer to before from Frontera, and uh, also some work in the telco space. But as I said, we are delighted to be involved, and um, it's now the uh, time to, I suppose, wrap, wrap things up for the afternoon. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, lunch is being served out the back behind you. Uh, 
my colleagues, Craig and Steve, who are here, we would love the opportunity to have a chat. Stellar RA uh, provides solutions across the whole gambit from, uh, from full strategy development to individual product sets and uh, individual project implementation. So if you'd like to have more of a chat, please find us at the back. Meanwhile, I uh, invite you to uh, head to the back of the room and enjoy lunch. Thank you.